Gut. Welcome everybody once again to this the Latino Book and Family Festival. Today we have a lot of great things happening. We have author sessions, library presentations, and more. Join us as we get started. All right. There's me. Yes, everybody. Hey, everyone. Hey. Morning. Morning. All right. So welcome, everybody. I'm really happy that you all were able to make it to this presentation. Um, let me go ahead and introduce one of, of every one of you. So basically, what we're going to do is each one of you are going to talk for around five minutes, and then we are going to go to the next person, then the next person. <laughs> And then after everybody has an opportunity to speak, we are going to invite the audience to come on and join us and ask questions and have a conversation about your books, your stories, and let's get started. All right. So let me get started with introducing all of you. OK, so first, let's get started with Alma. Alma, uh, today we have Alma Lazar, Javier Valderrama, Andrea Olatungi, and Susan Kralosmaski. Let's get started with Alma first, and let me introduce her. So Alma acquired her degree in Tourism Business Administration at the Autonomous University in Guadalajara, Mexico. She collaborated as a freelance writer with different local newspapers, worked for the Mexican government in the field of tourism, and opened her own travel agency. After relocating to San Diego, she explored the world of flora designing as she continued writing a variety of cultural articles. A new, story, a new story changed her perception of the world and she let her voice be heard through the inspiration of book, When the Light Goes Out, published in English and Spanish, Cuando la Luz se apaga. Alma, please, can you tell us a little bit about your story? What is this a book? What is this about? Sure. The book is a novel based on a true story. It's the story of Jorge Cantú, a remarkable human being, which is the perfect example of courage, love, tenacity, and most of all, that sends us the message that there are no limitations in this world. We follow our dreams and we achieve them no matter what obstacles come on, on the way. Jorge, spent, Jorge was born in, in Mexico City and he spent his child, childhood under extreme poverty. He was so poor that sometimes all they had to eat was tortillas with mayonnaise and a tea of orange leaves. That was his, the meal of a child, of a five-year-old child, <clears throat> excuse me, for him and his brothers, that's all they ate. Not only that, but he was physically abused every single day of his life. His mother had dreams to become a, an actress, a, a singer, I'm sorry, a, a performer, a singer and a dance dancer. That was her dream. Unfortunately, she became pregnant with the first child and four children after, you can imagine the weight on the, on the shoulders of this woman. And she blamed her children for everything that happened, not knowing that her destiny was just a result of her mistakes. When Jorge was 15 years old, he started working at a catering company. This catering company used to serve a banquets for politicians, very high rank politicians. So he started discovering a new world. He, he found food that he didn't even think that it could exist. And he learned to dress and speak differently. He met different people. So he, he started discovering that life was different than the life he had lived until then. After that, he started working for a pizza restaurant where he started as a bus boy, then he was transferred to the kitchen. Later, he was a waiter. After that, uh, he was a cashier, a cashier and then manager. 
and later general manager of the chain of uh, pizza uh, pizza restaurants that his boss owned. At, that was at 20 years old. At 20 years old, he bought the first house for his mom, the first house they ever lived in because they used to live in rooms that they used to rent for sometimes for one night, sometimes a week, a month, whatever she could pay, that's where they used to live. So he bought his first house at the age of 20. Later he became, he started working for the government and he ended up in Tijuana working for a, a female senator, helping her in her future political campaign. That's where he met his wife and he started his own business. He did great since the beginning, opening a, a skylight business he had very uh, important customers and he was doing great. He was living a happy life until one day destiny betrayed him. And then he became really depressed, developing some suicidal thoughts. And one day he realized that he was a warrior and there's still many more battles for him to win. So that's basically the story. I don't wanna go into a lot of details because for those of you, if some someone or if most of you read the book, I want you to enjoy it. But I just wanna tell you something. If you're like me, that you like to cook and eat, you're going to love those chapters when they're having huevitos rancheros with refried beans and cafe de la olla and the rolls just coming out of the oven. Oh my gosh, you're going to, you're, you're gonna love that. Also, uh, when I described the, the uh, typical cuisine from Merida, the cochinita pibil and salbutes and panuchos, all of those parts you're going to enjoy. But most of all, if you like to travel, you know that during pandemic, the pandemic, most of, all, most of us, especially me, I haven't been able to travel. So through this book, I could get away at least for in, in a few chapters when they were in Guanajuato, when Jorge and his twin brother were in, were in Guanajuato, following the Estudiantina in a Callejoneada all the way to Cerro del Pipila. And then they watch this almost mystical view from the top of the town of the Guanajuato. Once you finish the book, you will wanna buy your ticket to Guanajuato, trust me, because it, the, the description is beautiful and you really live those moments. Also, when he's in uh, San Francisco, you're gonna feel the, the fresh air in the morning uh, on the cable car and, and then that um, famous, clam chowder soup and fishers can work with a glass of wine, you're going to enjoy all of those things. So the book has everything. It, it's a sad story, yes, and hard at the beginning, but then it takes a different path. And um, something that you're going to enjoy, you're gonna learn, but most of all, you're gonna learn that there are no limitations on this life that can stop us from achieving our goals. I have much more to say, but you said five minutes, so <laughs> just tell me when to stop. <laughs> I, like, I like the message of being no limitations for what you want to do in life. Uh, all right. So we're going to get into this question afterwards. So let me uh, introduce our next presenter. I'm going to go with uh, Susan, then Andrea, and then Javier, if, if that's okay. All right. Let's get in. All right. Okay. So for Susan, uh, Susan Kralovansky, she... She wrote her first book titled, There Was a Tall Me a Texan Who Swallowed a Flea. That was released in 2013 with Pelican Publishing. Since then, she has written both fiction and nonfiction books. Susan is a founding member of the Nonfiction Ninjas and NFS. The book that Jake borrowed, El Libro Que Jake Tomó Prestado, is Susan's 19th picture book and fifth that she has il also illustrated. Susan's passion is getting kids excited about reading and writing. Her other passion is salting almond chocolate bars. There you go. Susan, would you like yeah. to tell us your story? Okay, sure. So this is how I got started writing. I was an elementary school librarian and I worked in a low income school. And because it was hard for my kids to read, they didn't want to read. And um, so, but you know, they still had things they needed to learn. So I started writing books for my students and I would put my students in it. Oops. So here's one of my books because I wanted to teach them about synonyms and antonyms. They needed to know that for testing. And then, it, so this line, if you can't 
See very well. So Cinderella was beautiful. I'm teaching about an antonyms. Cinderella was beautiful. Oh, this way. But her sisters were ugly. So then, oh, there's a ugly sister. Okay. So I used humor and the kids to get them excited about reading. I'm going to show you another one. Oh, of this. Um, and I used to have long hair. And so I always put myself in the books and then I would put my kids in the book and they started getting excited about reading. I made a, just, you know, just like this, I made a giant book of the book that Jake borrowed because I wanted my kids, every librarian does book care lessons at the beginning of the school year, but we didn't have anything fresh or new that librarians use. We all use the exact same book. And it had been been written like 20 years before. So I wrote this story about a little boy that every bad thing happens to his library book. And it follows the rhyme, the house that Jack built, so that um, when teaching kids reading, they get that rhythm. And, but then I tell kids when I do school visits, here's the fun thing about doing your own book. My son's name is Jake. And to me, this might not be very flattering, but to me, that looks exactly like my father when he was a child. And then it, here's a little self-promotion. The book that Jake borrowed happens to be one of my other books <laughs> that I did. So I, I love that when I'm at a school visit and kids will say, oh my gosh, he borrowed your book. Um, because everything bad happens to this little guy's book. You know, one of the things we teach kids is, um, you know, don't eat while you're reading. And he, so he does. And then the, his pet rat gets out and enjoys the jelly. But um, anyway, so I did this because I just wanted to celebrate with kids books and reading. And then I wanted to really honor librarians because, boy, they're the ones that that um, bring it all together. And then I'll, I'll show you one more thing. Another fun thing, when you're doing your own books, that's my dog, I have a standard poodle. So, so I put her in there. Anyway, um, but again, I was at a low income school and gosh, we didn't have, we had minimal amount of bilingual books. And so I wrote to Pelican and I said, hey, you know what, we use this, librarians use this book. Is there any way we could do this um, bilingually? So, and then, so that's this book. So it's this way in English and you flip it over and it's the Spanish version. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just so happy with, with what they did and with the response I've gotten. So, um, all right, I'll show you this. That, oh, let me, let me see if I can do this. Oh, oh. Can you turn on the, the volume on the table? Sorry, let me start it over. So that's how that book came about. Wow, so I'm really happy that 
your book includes librarians because after this session we have libraries coming in so three oh, good. librarians so good. You, you might want to stay and you know ask I them will. Yeah. <laughs> yes. they will they will like it they will like it yeah and let me see okay um but let's get into the discussion afterwards let me okay. go with andrea next uh let me go ahead and introduce you andrea so andrea olatunji she is an award-winning author and seasoned educator, lives uh, by her mission to validate and instill an appreciation for diversity in young children. She developed a passion for languages and cultures early on in her, in her 20 year plus career. A native of Uruguay, Andrea has gained valuable expertise with diversity in multicultural environments. Her children's book series, Nuestra Fauna, is a fantastic resource to learn Spanish in a con contextualized and fun way. The series features animals that are native to the Americas while teaching important values. Andrea, please share with us your story. Okay, well, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm very honored to be here in this panel. Um, well, I became an author basically out of necessity. I'm a Spanish teacher. I've been teaching Spanish here in the United States for about 20 years. And uh, I was blessed enough to teach everybody. I taught everybody from kindergarten all the way to college. And um, I'm, I've been always fascinated with books myself. I find books to be beautiful windows to other worlds and other situations, and also beautiful conversation starters. I'm a mom too, I have a six year old son. and. Every time we read stories, he comes with this bunch of questions, you know, some of them I know the answers, some of them I don't, but it's a fantastic opportunity to just, you know, have these conversations, find the answers together and, and learn, right? So um, as a teacher, I was always looking for books that represented uh, my culture, the Hispanic culture in all its diversity. And it was very hard for me to find. Uh, now we have more Spanish books out there or bilingual books, as Susan was saying. But before, I mean, like 10 years ago, it was really hard. And uh, most of the aspects of the Hispanic culture that were represented were just one-sided. So I really wanted to show everything all the way from Mexico to South America to Uruguay, Chile. And um, it was really hard or, you know, there were translations from English. They were not like genuine, you know, Hispanic stories. So at one point, you know, I had the time in my hands. I was like, okay, where's the time to just create my own books? So I started with this uh, series. My first book is Omar El Jaguar. And the second book is Guillo Arbadillo, that I'm honored to just receive an award from you guys. And um, and as best educational book, which honors me tremendously as a teacher. So these books, as you mentioned, feature animals that are native to our continent. And they also have very important messages. Uh, Guillo Armadillo was in fact inspired by my own students. This is based on a project that I used to do with my students that I call Mi Talento, where I challenged my students to teach the rest of us something that they knew how to do well. And um, it was, it's, very fun project, you know, kids come with all sorts of things from like cooking, playing instruments, making the Rubik cube, I mean, you name it. But there's also, you know, like a couple of them that always come to me after I explain the project and they're like freaking out. They're like, I don't know what to do. I don't have a talent, what can I do? And I was like, how come you don't have a talent? Everybody knows something that you can teach, right? So in helping them discover these unique talents, finding these uh, talents is that Guillo came to be. So Guillo is basically a little armadillo that starts his week going to school and he's very excited about it. And by the end of the week, he gets really frustrated because he can meet any of the uh, challenges that the teacher proposes. So there are about 11 different animals in this book. Like you can see there, the. Um, Monito Cappuccino, the Capuchin monkey, the iguana, you have the Nyandu. There's a bunch of animals. So by the end of the week, he's totally, let me show you. I oh, have there the Quetzal and Carpincho. And by the end of the week, he's really frustrated. He doesn't want to come back to school. He thinks school is not his thing, you know, it's not for him. So at the end of the story, there's a very unique event 
there's a truck coming and he gets scared. So he jumps and rolls into a ball. This is a three band armadillo. So he rolls into a ball and he rolls into the um, school front yard. And when he stands up, everybody's looking at him it's like, okay, how did you do that? That's pretty unique. So he discovers that he has this unique talent that not many other animals can do. So it's a beautiful story, again, to empower kids to, to the, look for and discover these talents, what makes them unique and special, uh, to talk with kids about you know, those talents and how talents can be super different. And you know they're all cool and they all can teach somebody else something. And that's a nice uh, interaction you can have with, with others. Uh, well, it has a ton of um, information about these animals from Latin, Latin America. And as a teacher, of course, I couldn't help but creating resources to help teachers. So I created a guide with, that has lesson plans and photocopyable materials. I'm always, you know, trying to, especially now with this pandemic, I mean, I know many teachers, especially those of us who teach little kids, you know, all of a sudden found ourselves teaching online and it was really hard, you know, to find the right resources and to engage kids online. I mean, my son is six and let me tell you, when we had online classes to have him on the computer for more than five minutes was a huge challenge. So I'm doing a lot of school visits and workshops with teachers to try to help them incorporate stories as the baseboard for units and all the contents you know, that we need to teach the kids. So I find that um, teaching vocabulary and grammar through a story, through events and things that kids can identify with you know, in a better way, I think that makes learning more memorable and more fun. So that's basically my mission. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, as you were mentioning the, the books, I think that's a really good story as especially for when you're as a student, the, the first day of school is the, I think is the biggest day of like, uh, well, that was personal. I'm speaking personally. Pretty frightening, <laughs> yes. It was scary. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. So for kids, I would imagine it's this too. <laughs> now, let me, uh, I, I do want to go a little bit more into you describing more about the process of how you get like a book into the, the classroom, because I, I know everybody would want to hear a little bit about that. Okay. All right. But let me go ahead and introduce Javier. And, and then we get started into a little discussion here. All right, so Javier Valderrama is originally from Santiago de Chile. He was born there. He went to film school at the Universidad del Desarrollo where he specialized as a screenwriter. Volantin Cortao, his first film, won Public Choice Award at the Valdivia International Festival in 2013. Taking a turn in his career, he decides to write short science fiction stories to culminate with the publication of his first novel, El Arca, and then his second novel, Animales Salvajes. All right, Javier, please okay. tell Hi, us everyone. your story. I'm going to share uh, my screen because I have a, a PowerPoint to introduce myself to help me to, um, to get the presentation. So, um, well, I'm honored to be here. I call this presentation from uh, screen to book because I went backwards usually from the book to the screen and well, backwards. So who am I? I am 31 years old. My name is Javier Valderrama. I live in Chile, in Santiago, um, in the capital. And I decided to be a filmmaker and I decided to specialize as a scriptwriter. Uh, my passion is uh, science fiction and horror, but in, in Chile, we don't have much of um, mm, like windows to, to make those films. So we have to make realism films. That's where I made my first film, Volantin Cortao or Kite Drift, as known in the US. And I, I won a few nominations. And then I work in another film called Young and Wild, uh, but in the art department. Sadly, for uh, money problems, I have to step aside and uh, look, uh, looking for a, a new um, job. So I start working as a cabin crew in an uh, airline here in Chile, like uh, Latin America, like for eight years. So how the Arca born? In one of my trips, I went to Madrid and I visited the 
um, natural science museum there. And I, and I met this animal. This is a tilacino, and it's an extinct animal. It's a human extinction causes because we kill them all. And I felt really sad about this, this story. So I promised him that I will redeem his condition by making a story. That's why I put my science fiction abilities and I wrote the, the, the Larka, the Arnie. So uh, later, I, I released the, the, the book in the, the middle of the pandemic. So I couldn't went to Madrid to show the Tilacino that, hey, my book is ready. Four years later, my book is ready and my promise is fulfilled. But uh, luckily, uh, before my resignation this year at the cabin crew, one of my last trips was to Madrid, where I can reunite with the Tilacino and show him that my promise, my word as a human being was worth it. And I felt so happy to, to, to show him that this science fiction book was like a possibility to him to renew, to re want his life, to be rebirth. So basically, that's my whole story really in a nutshell. And where you can find me? In Instagram, I have two profiles, Javo Valderrama F for my personal life and Javo Valderrama Escritor for my uh, career as a writer. So that's it. Really good, really small. <laughs> All right, well, I'm really happy that the four of you were able to join us here. And we also have Edward who's gonna help me moderate this session uh, in the discussion as we are going to. But first I wanna, well, congratulate everybody for having a book published because that's right there a great achievement. I know like Susan, Andrea, um, Javier and, and Alma, all of, actually all of you have more than one book, either the, the Spanish version, English version, having the books bilingual, so it's a, a contribution. And I know Javier, in the future, we're probably gonna see your books also in English if I'm in the future. Um, all right, so let's, let's get started with this session. I wanna, at this point, I wanna invite everybody who's watching, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. And also I'm gonna go back around with everybody. Where are you joining us from? So starting with me, I'm here in the north of San Diego and the same happens with Edward. We both are, are located in, here at the north of North San Diego. So it's around 11.30 right now here. How about um, Susan, where are you? Joining us. I'm, I'm in Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Austin, and it's 1.30 here. Andrea? I'm in New Orleans, and it's 1.30 as well. We're in Central Time. Right. Uh, Alma? Sorry, I'm in San Diego. All right. And Javier, where are you joining us from? <laughs> I'm um, actually in Santiago de Chile. Here is 3.33 p.m. <laughs> wow, there you go. Very international today with Javier here. <laughs> All right. And, and if, if, if I could, I, uh, on behalf of the Latino Book and Family Festival, which this is a part of, and for the International Latino Book Awards, I want to welcome all of you to be here. Uh, that is so awesome for all of your stories are so awesome and so inspirational. And I do have questions for everyone uh, that I would like to ask. It, it, should I go now, Anna? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to start from the beginning. So, uh, so I'm going to start with, first with Alma uh, in the same order that you guys present it. Uh, so um, your book is uh, sounds like it's very inspirational. And that's what we need in today's environment uh, because of everything that's going on. So I look forward to picking up a copy and reading uh, your book that talks about, yes, I can do it. I'm going to get past all of the things that I've gone through. So I, I thank you for that type of book because all our uh, kids and young adults and even adults need to hear that kind of story. So thank you so much for that uh, inspirational 
uh, book that you've written. Um, uh, it, I'm sorry, I missed how many books have you written? This is my first book. Thank oh. you for kind words first. And if I may, I would like to say something that I couldn't say at the beginning about what made me decide to write this book. Basically, of course, the story, but I wanted to let my voice heard and send a message to the world. It ended up being three messages. Number one, like I said, my protagonist Jorge was abused when he was a child. So number <laughs> one, no one, no one in this world has the right to abuse of a child in any form of abuse. That's the number one message. Number two, there was a point when I became part of the story that wasn't intended at the beginning, but it just happened. So the, num the, the second message that I want to, to send is the beauty of doing volunteer work because it talks a little bit about my experiences as a volunteer. And I know there are studies made that proves that a person who does a volunteer work used to tend a happier life, uh, live, I'm sorry, tends to live a happier life. And I agree with that. So that's the second message. And, and the third one, and I think that will be the one that most readers will be attracted to, is that there are no limitations on this world. We can achieve our dreams because no matter how many obstacles on the way, there's always tomorrow. And tomorrow is uh, the fresh new air, uh, the new sunrise, it's new. So don't ever give up on your dreams, just achieve your goals. Thank you so much for that. That that in itself is inspirational, and I hope a lot of our young adults hear that message from you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry at the beginning I missed uh, el apellido de Jorge. Uh, Jorge. You gave his whole name, right? Jorge Cantu. Okay. Jorge Thank Cantu. you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. And the book can be found in Amazon. Kindle, paperback, hardcover, English and Spanish. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move on to Susan. Wow, 19 books. Yes. That, is, that is awesome. Uh, and are all these children's books? Yes, yes. That, that, that's uh, you awesome. Know, people say to me, when are you gonna write? Are you gonna write a novel? Are you gonna write? And I just, no, I'm not. I just like to write for the little guys. That, that's awesome. Um, so, and, and they're all bilingual, right? You know what? No, only two are bilingual. Oh, okay, um, okay. That, yeah. And, you know, both times, so in school, we always teach our kids to write a persuasive letter. And when I do school visits, I tell them that that is one of your most important things that you'll learn because I would write my publisher a persuasive letter about how this needs to be bilingual. And uh, both of those books have gotten such a good response that I'm thinking, gosh, you know, like I need to go backwards. I wrote this, I made up an original tale about fire ants because I had moved to Texas and never heard of fire ants. And I thought, okay, I need to write to them and say, we need to make this bilingual. So. Anyway, no, I wish they were all bilingual, but only two. Well, and one of the things that you pointed out that as a writer, you get to put personal things in the book. So I love that you included your son, that you included yourself as a teacher, and you included the pets. So that's awesome. And that's a great message for anyone that's looking to uh, write. Uh, it opens up the, the whole world to them on what they can write on because they can write some personal story. So that's an awesome uh, story in itself. Um, Thank you. The, the other thing that, uh, you know, I, I'm so glad it's the last two books that you said are bilingual. Yes. Okay. So, good. Uh, one of the, go ahead. So this is my other one that's bilingual counting colors in Texas. And it's, and it's, it's a board book for little guys. And then, you know, it's just, identifying the different things in the in the pictures uh, are, are all the colors a little bit unique to texas yes and and the things are unique to texas like isn't this unusual there's a fence in texas that people okay, we, we lost your audio oh sorry can you hear there me you now go. yes okay. so there's a fence in texas now I'll scoot over where when people wear out their cowboy boots they hang them on that fence so 
then I have a friend that's a photographer and he just travels all over the state. You know, like there's our prickly pear. He travels all over the state and takes um, photographs and then I use those in my books. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about before the session started is that uh, I give books away and um, I often tell groups that I'm speaking in front of that if we had funding, the only type of book that I would give away would be bilingual books. And that's because whether you read English or you read Spanish, you can read it and then see how it's written in the other language. So exactly. being bilingual is such a blessing and there's so many benefits to being a, a bilingual person. In addition to uh, making more money if you're working for a, a federal, a city, uh, state government, because they all pay extra for people to be bilingual. So kudos to you for making your last two books bilingual. Oh, thank you. So Andrea, um, I love the, uh, your story about Mi Talento. What, what a great opportunity to have your young students come up with ideas about what it is that they want to present. So that, that is awesome. Um, uh, so um, how long have you been doing that kind of uh, having your children, you're, you're a teacher, you said, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how long have you been teaching and where are you teaching and what grade level? I've been teaching forever, <laughs> 20 plus years. Um, I started teaching English as a second language in Uruguay. And then I moved here to the United States in 2002. So you calculate 20 plus years, yeah. Since I moved here, I've been teaching Spanish, obviously. Um, and as I said, yeah, I work with all ages in different types of schools, immersion school, private, public schools. So it has given me an amazing, you know, array of experiences. And it's been just fantastic to work with these kids. I love working with children, talking with children, because they're so creative. You know, we forget this creativity as we grow up. And just to be in the little brains for a minute is just a fascinating thing. And, um, and the Mi Talento project came up just having this conversation with my students because I just noticed that they needed that space. They needed a space where I just close my mouth and I let them be the stars, be in the front of the classroom, showing us and teaching us. And the fact that they can teach something to their teacher and to their peers and it's something cool that some, many times, I mean, the rest of us have no clue how to do. Uh, it's just like absolutely validating and empowering for kids, you know, imagine it's like, I taught my teacher something that she didn't know how to do. It's like, imagine, you know, it's just fascinating. And um, I have to say, I mean, I learned a ton because truly they come and come up with stuff that I had no clue how to do. So it's, it's really a learning experience. And uh, it just opens this door, you know, to like, okay, the classroom is a safe space when I can express myself, where I can just show things that I know how to do and they're cool. And otherwise, I think if I didn't offer them this project, they didn't have the opportunity to teach me those things, you know, unless we're just randomly talking about it. But uh, I discover um, different aspects of my students that I wouldn't have known otherwise. And let me tell you, that is, as a teacher, that is gold. For me, it's absolutely helpful. Because if I know that, you know, uh, Javier likes to make movies, oh my goodness, I'm going to use that to help him learn, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's absolutely um, empowering for both sides, teacher and students. What, what a great concept to have uh, to, and on how to uh, bring your students into the discussion. That's a great uh, loop, a great project that you've begun. In fact, as you were talking about it, in the back of my mind was, wow, might that be an idea on writing a book? The, all the different showcasing all the different talents that all these kids bring to life. Thank so, you. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, if there's some teachers here in the audience, I think it's also a good reminder that sometimes as teachers, we need to step down. We need to just stop talking, just leave your curriculum on the side for a moment. I know it's important. I know we need to do it. But just let the kids shine for a minute. Let them tell you. Let them tell you their stories. And uh, 
just take a minute to do that. And it's, it's fascinating. I mean, again, I'm a Spanish teacher. I teach language. But when they come to me on a Monday and they go like, you know what? I just sit down. I'm like, yes, tell me what. <laughs> and that's when my stories come to life. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And Bunny Javier, my love of books started as reading science fiction uh, stories and comics. So kudos to you for uh, focusing on that subject matter. And the fact that you came from a screenwriter to a book writer, that's fantastic. That, that's inspirational in itself because it gives kids just a, a new dimension to look at, well, what do I want to do? Yeah, I want to be a screenwriter and write a, a great movie, but then to move, transition into a book writer, that is so fantastic. So kudos for that. Um, so it, in, um, you, you said that you're, you live in Santiago, Chile. Yes. Uh, and, uh, it, tell me is in Chile are the schools, um, are they teaching students there to be bilingual or are they focusing on uh, and I'm I'm gonna say because I don't know in Chile are they're speaking primarily Spanish? Yes, yes. Okay. So do they teach English or other languages in, in the schools? We used to teach uh, English and French, then only English. When I was a kid, they teach me only English, but but the the methodology the methodolo methodology, sorry, I, I'm a little rusty with the English, but the way they teach it is not really good. Actually, I didn't learn English by, by the school, <laughs> sorry, teachers. And I learned it by myself reading books in English, actually. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And here in Chile, we have a problem with piracy. So a lot of books didn't arrive here into our booksellers or bookstores. And I want to know about uh, books from Star Wars. And I realized that they weren't available here in Chile. So I just grab a copy in English and start to learn it by myself. So that's how I learned English. That, and that's why sometimes it costs me to, to translate what I'm talking in my head and say it in English, because it's not my like main language. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um... I think that's all I had, Anna. If you wanna, if you have any questions at this point. Yes. So we have some participants joining, and let me see if they are able to ask their questions. Let me see. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to make a comment back to to Susan because there we have two librarians already joining us watching this presentation, and so. I just want to know that to our librarians that are watching, uh, actually, Susan's book, it covers a little bit of, of the what happens to a book after you take it, a kid take, takes it home and it gets a little messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it that way. Um, Diana, do you have, what do you have to, to tell us on that, would you like to join the conversation now and, and just tell us your thoughts about about books? I hope you can you can join us here in the discussion. I see you there, but <laughs> I'm not sure if she's preparing uh, because we have a, a, a following presentation after this, and it's all about libraries and the services from libraries because we all um, are aware that oh, there's Diana. Hey, Diana. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, Anna and Edward and all panelists. Um, uh, I just joined in because I'm one of the next panelists, but um, it's actually a pleasure to be here with you and get to know you. So um, I am a librarian, San Diego County Library at Encinitas Branch. So the question is what happens with the book when it's published and added to the collection? Is that the question? Well, no, but thank you for bringing that, that up because what happens if any of the authors here present want to have their books in a library? Do you know? Oh, okay. So if one of the authors want to have his book added to the collection, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, they have to approach any of the branches 
and they have to talk to one of us, one of the librarians, and fill out a form. It's um, an author um, uh, author form for um, adding uh, a title to the collection. So they have to submit um, one copy um, and um, explain why uh, that publication will add to our collection, um, what would be the benefits for the community. And so the title is reviewed by a collection development team and they decide if um, it's a, a good match for our communities and our systems uh, needs and likes, and then it is added. Um, when we add, we add a minimum of two, or I think it's three copies, um, actually three, because we have to consider that the title uh, can be requested by one or, or more uh, people. Sometimes there might be the printed copy in one of the locations, and we have 33 branches, and sometimes um, our collection floats, uh, and sometimes uh, it's just at one of the branches, it's requested, and then it travels to wherever it's requested from. Um, so I would say good luck. <laughs> uh, try to have your, your title added to the collection. It will be a pleasure. Um, of course, it has to, um, to uh, meet certain standards, but it, if it has been published, you have already worked with a publisher. Um, so you have half of the way already uh, gone through. <laughs> yes, so that's, that's the story. And um, sometimes it can become a downloadable book. That's another option. You know that our collection is not just the physical collection, but also the digital collection. Um, so that would be a great asset too. All right. Well, thank you, Diana, for that insights about getting books into libraries. Mm -hmm. And now you just gave me an idea to have a session all about that. <laughs> it's a lot to talk about. Okay, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and, and have each one of the authors here present. If, if you can all give us a... Oh, Alma, you have a question? Yes, for Diana, I just wanted to ask her if we want... To, where do we get the form to submit the, uh, the title? Oh, okay. Um, you can come to any of the branches or um, you can uh, email us um, and then we will, we will send you um, an attached file with the form. We okay. can do that. Thank so you. just go to sdcl.org, like San Diego County Library.org. Yes. Thank you right. very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's have some uh, final comments from, from the authors because I know, um, we have a session here uh, that's ending. Let's go ahead and, and hear a little bit from uh, Andrea. Would you do you have an, a final comment you want to give everyone about, I don't know, anything in general, some final thoughts? Um, OK, yeah, I just would like to encourage parents and teachers to bring more diverse books to the classroom and home. I think it's very important for, for children to be exposed to different types of books where they can see not only themselves, but also different uh, peoples from different parts of the world, from different color skins, different backgrounds, and, um, and expose them to that because many times, you know, a child might have the opportunity to travel or might be living in a community which is pretty diverse and they can see all different types of peoples, but sometimes that's not the case. So through books and stories, that's a fantastic opportunity. And um, I also invite parents and teachers to connect with me. My website is cuentacuento.com, cuentacuento.com. There you can learn more about me and my books, Omar and, and Gisho. And I also have, as I said, resources for teachers and parents. Many parents are now on homeschooling. So if you're interested, just visit uh, my page, cuentacuento.com, and my books are also on Amazon. Thank and you. I, and just actually, I just got reminded of the, wanted to ask you about that, the teacher's materials. How is it that 
you develop a, a teaching guide based on your book? Do you make it interactive with lines to write things down? Or for, for well, no, it's more like a, like a resource for the teacher. So it comes with uh, 10 lesson plans for each book. And they're based on the actual standards, the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. So I use the standards to uh, base my lessons. And they're basically lessons to teach different aspects of the language and the culture through mm -hmm. elements that you can find in the story. When I write the books, um, I do it intentionally to, to help uh, kids learn the language. So you can find there like very easy, simple sentences that at the same time, you know, have different elements like greetings, days of the week, animals, colors, verbs. And, um, and in the guide, I'm just helping teachers with uh, activities. I know teachers are very creative and sometimes they, I have visited schools and teachers come up with, oh, you know what I did with your book? And they come with fantastic ideas, but uh, I wanna help them also with other ideas on, on how you can use the book. I know we are very busy people in the classroom and we don't have time sometimes to, to plan and develop units. And if we have a book that we like and that kids enjoy and you can you know, use it like, I always compare it with like an onion, you know, that has different layers. Like mm -hmm. when I first published Omar, I was teaching middle school and the, um, my school principal invited me to come and do a, um, a reading to kindergartners. And my students heard about that and they got really jealous. They were like, what, you're reading to them and you're not reading the book to us. So we ended up just using Omar. We did a whole exploration on the Amazon forest and we explored, you know, like um, we studied like why the jaguar is endangered. And, you know, we spent like a whole month using the elements of the book. So that's basically what's, what's in the guides. Wow. Well, thank you for, for sharing that information with us. Yeah. And I know some of the authors here in this presentation afterwards, they are gonna wanna think about that also implementing their, providing a teacher's guide. Yeah, it's always helpful, you know, as educators. I mean, we always like to, to have resources that we can use and that can help us, you know, save time and at the same time develop um, meaningful lessons, you know, to the kids. And, and I, I teach Spanish, so my guys are more focused on the teaching of the language. They have a little bit on, you know, like Latin American fauna, endangered species, the Amazon forest. But, uh, you, you know, if you have a book that you want to publish or that you publish, think about the, the theme of the book, think about all the possible themes that can come out of the mm -hmm. story and, um, and you know, what kind of different activities you can create to help teachers. It can be from, you know, like word puzzles, it can be games, it can be project ideas. Sometimes even a list of guiding questions that you can use at the end of the story to have this conversation with kids that can be very helpful. Oh, all right. Well, sounds good. Welcome for being here. Like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm honored. <laughs> Uh, Susan, any final um, thoughts from you, messages? Yes. Um, you know, um, Andrea gave me so many things to remember. So, you know what? I knew, because again, I made this originally for my students, for my little kids. But when I was invited to read to middle school, and when I got to this page where the little boy has to take his bank in, and those middle school kids are like, they, you know, they'd all been there. They'd all had a terrible experience. And I thought, um, oh my gosh, I need to submit this to my publisher. Okay, then also I'm, I'm sharing this. So I'm also like Andrea that, so coming from an educational background, this is my website and here are my books and I'll go down to um, this one. And so in it, then I have made for librarians, whether they want kids to just, uh, make their own bookmarks or just color a bilingual one. But again, it's lessons about how to take care of books. Um, this is the book trailer that we watched earlier. Okay, wait a minute. Now I'll have, I'll go to this one that a, a full activity guide, or I do readers theaters for teachers and, and librarians and parents. So I just want that educational aspect for um, any of my books. Oh, all right. I, I like it. I like the fact that you have it all set up there on the website. <laughs> that's, that's really good. And the, and the videos too, that's something for every author to consider or everybody to consider creating a, a little book trailer there as well. 
uh, Alma, and then we go with final thoughts from Javier. Thank you. Just wanted to say that uh, I want you to invite you to visit my video on YouTube. It's Cuando la Luz se Apaga by Alma Lazar. It's a small video clip. And also I have my website, www.almalazar.com. You can, if you wanna send me an email, I'll be glad to respond. Just tell me I'm one of the authors and I'm not really good at uh, social media, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm on Facebook and I just started an Instagram. I don't have followers, but if you follow me, I promise you I'll follow you too. <laughs> and, it will, and I'll get going. <laughs> All right, thank you, Alma. Thank Javier, you. I know you, pro you are more into social media. So yeah, I'm a, bit, we can I'm a little bit back. present there, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'm a man of a few words, so I'm going to say this really quickly. But I invite everyone to take care of our home, planet Earth. We only have one, and if we don't, where we go? We all, we all, all the time imagine like the future of mankind in the moon or Mars or any other planet, but we only have this home. And the El Arca is about that, is what happens if we lose our home? So we have to understand that we are neighbors from the other animals and plants here. We can't like expand ourselves without living. So that's just my final thought. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful, and that's really true. Climate change is here and it's here to stay. So we have to, to do something about it. All right, so I wanna thank everybody for being here. Thank I'm, you. I'm really happy that you all accepted the invitation to, to join us. And all just want to let everybody know that all the information from the authors in this presentation is going to be archived at lbff.us. All right.